Hi, William Mays, DUI attorney here in Michigan, and welcome back to part three of my series on standardized field sobriety tests. In part one, I covered the 1977 study, uh, the initial research into the standardized field sobriety test battery by the Southern California Research Institute and the 1981 study along with uh, uh, the good Osberger study and how these, these initial tests came about and the problems that NHTSA and SCRI had in those initial days many years ago. Uh, culminating, of course, in the 1990 validation studies that have so many statistical flaws in them that it's problematic for field sobriety tests. So this is part three where I, I promised everyone this is a little bit more orientated towards the lawyer crowd. Um, it starts off with this slide where I've got this, this friendly judge, <laughs> friendly judge. You know, as defense attorneys, what we are used to in court is we say objection and the judge denied as quick as they can. So, you know, how do we get this information in so that the jurors can hear about the flaws in the standardized field sobriety test battery? Um, under, you see, Michigan has passed some statutes. Now, not every state has done this. Not every state has done this, but some have. Uh, Michigan has passed 257.62A that defines standardized field sobriety tests, but also includes language that says that in order for a test to be a standardized field sobriety test, it must be conducted in substantial compliance with the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration's protocols. So we know that there's a standardized method for administering the HGN, there's a standardized series of clues and a standardized way of assessing a subject's performance. This should not be controversial in terms of how the tests are administered and the ramification, of course, for improperly administering a test is that it compromises the validity of the test. Now, this is straight from the 2023 uh, manual that discusses how validation of the standardized field sobriety test battery relies upon the standardized methodologies, right? So it says that the validation only applies when the tests are administered in the standardized manner, the standardized clues are used to assess the subject's performance, and the standardized criteria are employed to interpret that performance. If any one of the standardized field sobriety test elements is changed, the validity may be compromised. Now, in prior manuals, before 2015, uh, it did not say may, and, and this was in all caps and bold, and I think it was also underlined. Uh, they really wanted to drive this point home in the early years of standardized field sobriety testing. And now, of course, they've kind of watered it down and they want to add that word may and they don't you know, make it in all caps and bold. But this, uh, you know, the statistical validity of the tests, for whatever it's worth, depends upon standardized administration and scoring, and you can't compromise that. And of course, that's built into the statutory language here in Michigan. If you're going to engage in substantial compliance, then of course you should also understand that compromising the various elements will compromise the validity. So officers who are trained in the standardized field sobriety test battery are taught repeatedly that there's only three standardized tests, HGN, walk and turn, and one leg stand. Um, why or how officers who have taken that course might then stray and say, oh, I'm going to do my tests. I'm going to do them my way. Officers who are trained and have taken, at, at, at a rudimentary level, the simple participant manual uh, and, and the general introduction to standardized field sobriety tests are taught about the standardized field sobriety test battery being only these three tests and how these other tests were rejected back in 77. You can't then, as an officer, reinvent the wheel and say, I'm going to do it my way. But nonetheless, we constantly see officers using the alphabet technique, the countdown technique, and the finger count te technique. These are techniques. They are not tests. And, and the, the admissibility of the so-called techniques should be severely limited by the courts. But courts don't really 
readily appreciate what these techniques are, what their purpose is, or how they're being utilized. So this is part of the personal contact phase, phase two of the DWI detection and standardized field sobriety training course materials. During that phase, officers are trained to ask uh, unusual questions, uh, ask for multiple documents to be provided at one time, and engage in these techniques that are divided attention tasks to determine whether or not the motorist should be ordered to exit the vehicle, nothing else. This is simply building up enough probable cause to believe that the person should be ordered to exit the vehicle for standardized field sobriety testing. Officers that are, are, are trained are taught point blank, and this still remains in all caps, that these techniques do not replace the standardized field sobriety tests. And it's emphasized. These are not tests. There's no known failure rate for the alphabet or the counting backwards or the finger count. And, and certainly if those preliminary screens, those additional techniques don't have known relevance or reliability or stati statistical validity, then when officers go off the reservation and just make up their own tests, I mean, we're introducing a whole new thing here that I've literally had officers and, and police officers that are watching this are going to laugh. I have had officers request a person to do the one leg stand with their head tilted back and their eyes closed. Literally 99.5% of people cannot perform that test. Try it yourself and see if you can adequately do the one leg stand with your eyes closed and head tilted back. So alphabet, finger counting, and backward count, they were all rejected back in 1977. We know this from the first part of my, uh, of my you know, presentation, but, but we can just look back at the 77 study and see, verify that those tests were rejected. They were rejected for a reason. I mean, the alphabet, as I've indicated previously, there's language issues, you know, if you're not a native English speaker, uh, there's educational issues. Many people have not recited their alphabet since they were five or six years old. And I know that DUI officers and I are constantly saying our alphabet because we think about these things. But when's the last time you sang the song John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt? And if you were required to do that, could you do it to prove your sobriety? And unless you got little kids, you haven't sang John Jacob Jingleheimer Schmidt in a long time, I guarantee it. So is there any sort of known relevance or reliability to these things? It doesn't matter. The whole point of using the alphabet technique, the count backward technique, and the finger count is to determine whether or not the motors should exit the vehicle. And since 1977, with the case of Pennsylvania versus MIMS, officers are allowed to order the motors to exit the vehicle for officer safety. This is merely out of expediency that we still use these and primarily for roadside sobriety checkpoints. Michigan, even though it's a Michigan case, Michigan v. Sitz went up to the U.S. Supreme Court where they ruled that sobriety checkpoints were legally okay. Michigan doesn't allow them because under the Michigan Constitution, the Michigan Supreme Court on remand from the U.S. Supreme Court held that our state constitution provides greater protection and will not permit sobriety checkpoints. On a sobriety checkpoint, though, an officer needs to be able to make a fast determination. Should I have this motorist pull over? Should I have this motor, motorist exit the vehicle? Because meanwhile, you know, there's a crowd of 30 other cars behind that car. Let them go or briefly detain. That's what the additional techniques are for. Oh, and I'm sorry, I missed this slide or this portion. Under Michigan law, we have People versus Rizzo, 243 Mishap, 151, a 2000 in case that said that based upon the strong order of an intoxicating beverage, an, an officer has the right to, to ask a motorist to perform field sobriety tests to dispel or confirm whether or not the alcoholic beverages that may have been consumed may have uh, compromised the person's ability to drive a vehicle. So the alphabet uh, counting backwards and finger count techniques are controversial because there's been no 
sincere effort since 1977 to study the statistical relevance and reliability. We might find out, of course, that, that there's a number of categories of people that simply can't perform the alphabet or counting backwards or finger count for a variety of reasons that we haven't even thought about. Uh, under um, 702 and 703, these types of tests should be excluded. And, and, and under, we've got Michigan Rule of Evidence 403, that even if it is relevant, it's more prejudicial than probative because jurors don't understand when an officer testifies, I failed the alphabet test is what they'll always say. How did he fail the alphabet test? He missed a couple of letters. Who cares? Honestly, who cares? Unless the proponent of the evidence, the prosecutor, can prove that that somehow means that the person is actually intoxicated or impaired, that's just simply prejudicial. It implies, of course, that the person is too drunk to do the alphabet, but we know that there might be a number of reasons why that person can't recite the alphabet that are totally unrelated to their sobriety. And this leads to my next point here. The proponent of evidence bears the burden of establishing relevance and admissibility as a matter of basic Hornbook law, according to People v. Crawford, 458 Mish 376, a 1998 case. Any time that a person is, is proposing to introduce evidence, whether it's the prosecution or the defense, they have the burden of establishing the relevance and reliability of that evidence. Relevance, of course, is pretty broad, and it's easy to meet that relevancy threshold. Uh, you know, you want to accuse the witness of lying? Well, accusing a witness of lying is, is always relevant. Uh, you want to accuse the, the witness of having a motive? Sure, you're allowed to do that. But what if you want to suggest something crazy or insane. Uh, the reason why my client was unable to operate a motor vehicle that day was because of his lycanthropy. He, he is a werewolf and there was a full moon. Okay, well, that's crazy. As the proponent of that evidence, I better be able to show that, you know, that there's some relevance uh, and, and, and that that type of evidence is admissible. Otherwise, it's not admissible. And under, like I said, Michigan Rule of Evidence 403, if it's more prejudicial than probative, uh, if even if it is somewhat relevant to suggest that a person isn't able to say their alphabet for speculative reasons, whether it's sobriety or education or something else, it, it should be excluded because jurors don't understand that it's not a test. Now, I teach a class at Madonna University. I'm an adjunct professor uh, at the Forensic Science Division there, and I teach a class called uh, Ethics and expert witness testimony. And we constantly talk throughout the entire semester about what the nature of expert testimony is. And, and the question is, when it comes to standardized field sobriety tests, is this expert testimony? Is a lot of police officer testimony expert testimony? In, in, in MCL 257-625-S, the, the statutory language talks about how a witness who's qualified by knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education is allowed to testify to the standardized field sobriety test battery, right? That, that's language that's drawn directly from Michigan Rule of Evidence 702, Federal Rule of Evidence 702, and Daubert, which is a U.S. Supreme Court case that deals with expert witness testimony. I think that this is the state lawmaker's acknowledgement that standardized field sobriety tests are, in fact, in the realm of expert witness testimony. Lay witness testimony, on the other hand, falls under MRE 701. And lay witness testimony is very simple. It's very rudimentary. Uh, as a lay witness, I, it was my opinion that it was windy out that day. It was my opinion that it was hot out that day. It was my opinion that that car was driving too fast for road conditions. It is simply an opinion. And it's an opinion that shapes the witness's perception of what the testimony is and gives a, a more helpful understanding of that witness's um, testimony to the jurors. It is not scientific evidence. It's not expert testimony, in other words. And, and the funny thing is, is that in my ethics and expert witness course, what the students oftentimes struggle with initially in the course is what is expert witness testimony? 
expert witness testimony does not need to be forensic science. It, it can cover a broad range of professional fields. So, for example, an engineer who is called to testify as to why a bridge failed. The structural failure, based upon my expert opinion, blah, 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 is expert testimony. Likewise, an accountant might be called as a valuation expert to testify in a divorce proceeding that a doctor's perceived value because of his assets and his properties and his investments, he's worth $2.5 million presently with potential future earnings of $8 million. That would be expert witness testimony. It's something that is not commonly shared by other witnesses. If, if other people on the jury, if the fact finders can say, yeah, that's my opinion too, or I could share that opinion if I saw it that way, that would be lay witness opinion. Whereas expert witness testimony requires some specialized skill or knowledge or training or education. Uh, there's a U.S. Supreme Court case called Kumo Tire where an expert was proposing to testify that the cause of an accident was a blown out tire manufactured by Kumo, <laughs> coincidentally. Uh, that expert witness was excluded because the basis for that testimony was simply, well, we didn't come up with any other reason as to why the accident may have occurred. He said, well, expert witness testimony can extend to people like auto mechanics. It, it's something that's specialized knowledge. It does not require you to be a forensic science scientist or have any sort of fancy degree, but that testimony in and of itself was excluded by the U.S. Supreme Court because it didn't have adequate foundation, and they said that um, it was ipsy-dixit reasoning in the Kumo Tire decision. Uh, just simply, th this is what happened, and, and, and there's no basis for it. So, therefore, it was held that it was inadmissible expert witness testimony. So, MRE 702 and Daubert, as you can see up on the screen, this is our expert witness rule. It does not have um, a lot of notations to it. We construe it on a case-by-case -case basis. There's some good published case law on it in the Michigan courts. But I want to, oh, well, I wanted to turn to 701 and 702 and talk about police officer testimony and, and how Michigan courts have kind of muddied the waters when it comes to police officer testimony. You see, the higher courts, well, I guess all courts, give deference to police officer testimony. Police officers make reference to their training and experience all the time. Well, you know, police officers are not innate uh, drunk detectors, right? There have actually been studies uh, published where police officers, bartenders, and I can't remember what the third category of people were, but they were required to watch a person sitting in a chair, get up from the chair, walk across the room, come back and sit back down. Some of them were drunk and some of them were not drunk. And the question was, could the police officers tell you know, that these people were drunk? And statistically, bartenders and police officers fared, fared no better than other people. They didn't have any specialized skill, in other words. Yet, when we see it in the courts, there's deference to police officer training and experience. In other words, there's a... I don't know, there's a deference given to police officers because they're police officers. And in a moment, we'll see that yet at the same time, jurors are instructed to not give deference to police officers. So in this case of People versus Dixon Bay, the court talked about there's this interplay between 701 and 702, lay witness testimony and expert witness testimony, and how this is kind of get, it gets a little confusing regarding police officer training and experience. Nonsense. It, there is no confusion. There is obviously mixed testimony by police officers. You know, police officers are allowed to have opinions just like everybody else. It was hot out. It was windy out. The car was driving too fast, in my opinion. But then there's also expert witness testimony. You know, when we're dealing with, well, I'll get to that in just a moment, but we've got this People versus McDonald case. An unpublished case from 2001 where the Court of Appeals gave deference to a police officer's testimony when he improperly conducted the horizontal gaze nystagmus and improperly conducted the preliminary breath test. And they said, well, that's worth some weight in the officer's mind. No, the officer did the HDN test in one pass. That's insane, of course, if you're a police officer watching this, 
He did it in one pass, and he did the PBT well under the 15-minute observation requirement, or not observation, but determination in our state. Um, did it well under that while the person was smoking a cigarette. This case was just simply incredible, but it gave deference to the officer's training and experience and said that the district court judge who discounted and suppressed those two tests should have given it some weight and held that there was probable cause for the arrest based upon what they perceived that officer would have testified to based upon his training and experience. The same week that McDonald came down, there was another case, People versus Roby, that was a published decision where an officer improperly conducted a PBT and improperly conducted an HGN. The tests were both suppressed. The Court of Appeals affirmed it on that panel, and that case is published. McDonald is an aberration. It has uh, not gained any, uh, any, any status since then, and it is not published. So People versus Roby is binding. But McDonald, I bring it up just because the Court of Appeals gave deference to an officer who clearly wasn't qualified to even render an opinion under the statutory language. And, and frankly, how could he mess it up that badly, you know? So in seven, when it comes to 701 uh, and 702 confusion, there should be no confusion. The federal courts and the federal cases have acknowledged that in many instances, police officers offer mixed testimony. So an officer who's involved in undercover narcotics, they gain, obviously, a lot of specialized information, information that me and prosecutors and jurors don't share because we're not members of that circle. And that police officer might have opinions regarding certain aspects of the case, but then there's other things that are expert testimony measurements, transactions, code words, and that sort of thing, that is expert testimony. And there's no problem testifying to both as long as an adequate foundation is laid by the prosecution to establish that the witness has the adequate knowledge, uh, education, training, experience, etc. This happens all the time. It's not unusual. On the other hand, however, <laughs> HGN, as I, I created this cartoon, I'm very proud of it. <laughs> No one's sitting in a bar telling their buddy, hey, buddy, I noticed your eyes are kind of getting a little nystagmus in them. Uh, you, you ought to slow down on, on the number of beers. We've never heard anyone in a bar say that, right? Uh, HGN is, I mean, that requires expert witness testimony. And then take a look at this, um, and then I'll tell you a brief story. The federal rules out in 701 contains a note that cautions that we do not allow lay witness opinion testimony to replace expert witness testimony and that we have to carefully guard and scrutinize the testimony before it might be admissible. Uh, we don't allow lay opinion testimony to get introduced or expert witness testimony to be introduced under the guise of lay witness testimony. I literally had a blood case in the last year here where Michigan State Police was prepared to testify to a blood result using gas chromatography. I demanded expert witness materials. And the prosecutor in frustration finally said, what exactly are you looking for? I said, all the expert witness materials. There's under 703, we're entitled to the basis of the expert's testimony. And the prosecutor looked at me and he said, are you asking for like something that deals with the guy who pours the blood into the machine and pushes the button up in Lansing? And I said, yes. And that's not how gas chromatography works. This prosecutor has no idea how blood is tested for alcohol at the Michigan State Police Forensic Science Division. And so he did not understand that there's a packet of information that's 50 to 60 pages long that the defense is entitled to. He was prepared to try to introduce the laboratory forensic scientists' opinion as lay opinion. So he proposed to have the forensic scientist come into court and say under oath, it was my opinion that I looked at that blood and I thought to myself, that looks like a .152. <laughs> And under recent uh, rule changes, 
uh, here in Michigan. We are now entitled to misdemeanor discovery. We've had felony discovery, criminal discovery, for quite a while, uh, but misdemeanor discovery, it hasn't existed until just the last couple of years. This is largely due in part to the efforts of attorney Josh Blanchard, who was one of the attorneys that represented one of the many defendants on the Whitmer kidnapping case. Uh, Josh Blanchard and I have been friends for many, many years, and uh, he was working hard to get this discovery rule passed, and I opposed it. <laughs> I, I thought I did not like the idea of reciprocal discovery because every time that the courts adopt a discovery rule, they always want reciprocal discovery from the defense. And I wanted to oppose that because inevitably what happens is we get nothing, they strike our experts, they strike our testimony, always works to the detriment of the defense, I told him. Well, it's been a couple of years now and, and I have come out and I've publicly apologized to Mr. Blanchard. He was right, I was wrong. Uh, this is better than the Freedom of Information Act. I'm getting a lot more materials through criminal discovery and, and I owe that in large part to his efforts. And, and, and I'm just publicly acknowledging this and also, of course, publicly posting some of the courtroom art that's been drawn of Mr. Blanchard because I think it's so spot on and he looks exactly like that in real life. You can trust me on that. Um, and, and the rest of the courtroom art, he somehow, he has enemies in the courtroom sketch artist because that's one of the better drawings of Mr. Blanchard from his various cases. In any event, under the new criminal discovery rules that apply to misdemeanor cases, upon the written demand uh, by the defense attorney, uh, the defense is entitled to a copy of the expert witness's curriculum vitae, which is basically a fancy way to say their resume, and a, a written description of, their, of the substance of their proposed testimony and the underlying basis of their opinion. So when it comes to the Michigan State Police Toxicology uh, Unit, we're entitled to the underlying documentary evidence that supports the opinion. And this would have, had this been applicable, where in the state where Annie Duquan, uh, the f uh, fraudulent forensic scientist that was dry labbing out in Massachusetts a few years ago. Had this criminal discovery rule been in force in Massachusetts at that time, and people had demanded access to the underlying documentary evidence that supported her opinion when she was dry labbing, this would have prevented that. So, I mean, the Michigan State Police have been cooperative for the most part with fulfilling these discovery demands. And, uh, you know, that's how science should work when you're dealing with forensic science. But had, had these rules been in effect a few years ago, I think uh, it would have circumvented or, or, or stopped um, a number of problems that we've seen with dry labbing and fraudulent forensic science. Disclosures, these disclosures need to be made. And of course, defense attorneys need to demand that they get the access to this material, but that's a different story for a different day. So I had mentioned earlier how the courts give deference to police officers, and they really do. They really do. We have a court rule, uh, I'm sorry, not a court rule, but a jury instruction that's given to jurors regarding police officer testimony. Uh, 5.11 states, you have heard testimony from a witness who is a police officer. That testimony is to be judged by the same standards you use to evaluate the testimony of any other witness. Y y for the most part, jurors already understand this, but there's always a couple of jurors, of course, that are going to give deference to a police officer, whether this instruction is read or not. And I think that the other jurors, even though they say, yeah, I'm going to treat it the same as I would any other testimony, they really don't. They give deference to police officers just like the courts do because that's a police officer. We're supposed to be trusting our police officers, right? When we're little kids, we're taught if you get lost, you go find a police officer. That's what our mothers tell us. And it, but, it, you know, this instruction, I think it's, I don't know, I guess it's got some utility, but it's almost useless. It's almost useless. I think that when it comes to standardized field sobriety tests, that the far more powerful uh, jury instruction is the one that limits expert witness testimony under 5.10. And this is right side by side in, this, in these jury instructions. The expert witness rule states, you have heard testimony from a witness, uh, police officer friendly, who has given you his opinion as an expert in the field of standardized field sobriety tests. 
Experts are allowed to give opinions in court about matters they are experts on. However, you do not have to believe an expert's opinion. Instead, you should decide whether you believe it and how important you think it is. When you decide whether you believe an expert's opinion, think carefully about the reasons and facts he gave for his opinion and whether those facts are true. You should also think about the expert's qualifications and whether his or her opinion makes sense when you think about the other evidence in the case. By reading this instruction, I think that it gives more for the jury to actually analyze. And furthermore, through the expert witness disclosures, we should be entitled to obtain copies of the, you know, to know which, which standardized field spread training manual were you taught out of. Was it the 2004, 2006, 13, 15, whatever. What prior instances have you testified in? Have you uh, written any peer-reviewed studies on, on standardized field sobriety tests? Have you taken A-Ride or the Drug Recognition Expert Program? These things are all relevant to the foundational aspects of the expert witness testimony, and disclosures like that should be made in advance of trial so that the prosecution and defense both know what should be presented to the jurors. And lastly, I want to close by giving thanks to Alan Trapp, a dear friend of mine from years ago. We were very good friends at the National College for DUI Defense. Back in 2012, he had put together some of these statistics, and I asked him for a copy, and he provided it to me so that I could work on a presentation I did many years ago. I've kind of taken some of those old materials of what he had provided to me, and then the materials that I used to make that, and put it all together for this presentation that I've put up here on YouTube for you all to see. Uh, Alan passed away in 2015, and I was shocked to think just how much time has gone on. I mean, it's been over a decade since, you know, he provided these materials to me. And it's been, what, almost, well, nine years since he passed away. And he and I used to talk about radio ads uh, because I used to advertise on WRIF 101 in Detroit. And he was advertising on fall football down in Georgia. And we would laugh and, you know, have a couple of drinks over discussing our radio ads and the, the announcer would come on the radio down there in these football games during the breaks and say, if you're charged with a drunk driving, Alan Trapp is the go-to guy for DUI in Western Georgia. And so, uh, you know, I, I wanted to give a thanks to him. And thank thanks to you for, for watching this video. I hope you got something out of this. Apologize, I'm struggling with the, the technology. I know that the first video didn't turn out so great. I was a little too close. I'm working on, on trying to present a higher quality um, video and presentation to you and and I hope to bring you additional materials in the near future as soon as I get a, a moment I will post yet another video on another subject um, so subscribe if you like and and thanks again for watching